possible things as opposed to killing your mother and father and all that kind of stuff. Um, or what? I don't even want to know what you all dream. Uh, <laughs> that's okay. Uh, but that's okay. And that might indicate a kind of intentionality that carries over a kind of wish, if you will, if you want to use dream terms. Um, and it can be used to... Um, uh, there's a whole... Th I mean, I don't want to get into this too much, uh, but there's a whole theory of dreams in Buddhism that's similar to Western concepts, uh, ideas, but then has some very unique aspects to it. And one is the dream state, if it's cultivated properly, can be an actual channel uh, for instruction from Buddhism, bodhisattvas, and sages, and so forth, your, your receptivity. But then to, to work that mechanism, you have to have discernment to tell when it's really a genuine teaching and so you're back to the same principles. You have to still use discernment to figure out, was this an accurate teaching? So you match it against the teachings themselves. You match it against your own experience, the text, and so forth. Um, but it can be a very powerful mechanism for teaching and transforming someone because the sense organs, while you're sleeping, go into a state similar to meditation, the eyes and, and so forth. And uh, sort of the uh, conscious ego mind is a little more... Uh, less guarded, you're more docile, and, and therefore that can be a teaching mechanism. And you'll see, uh, next semester we're gonna do a course on uh, monks and nuns, biographies, autobiographies, and you'll see in that uh, many of them report dreams uh, in very profound ways as being turning points in their cultivation. Uh, Master Han yeah, Master Han Shan, I talked about Juri last week, my own teacher, uh, Xu Yun also, uh, many report these, uh, forest monks report these often, and they become markers for their development and cultivation. They're almost as, ad as important as meeting a, uh, a good and wise advisor in many ways. So, but that's a whole other class. I mean, we could do that sometime if you're interested uh, in going into the dreams. Uh, and sometimes they're used for diagnostics in Buddhism as med medical diagnostic. Uh, depending on what elements overwhelm in your dream, whether it's fire or water or whatnot, you can use as a diagnostic tool for your health uh, and, and so forth. But if you're just s sitting in meditation and dreaming that, that's a nice dream, um, but it's probably not the same as actual meditation, but it's not bad. Uh, some people who uh, dream also can be troubled by ghosts and spirits in your dreams. I just throw this out for you, those people understand. If you don't, that's okay, forget about it, you don't want to. Um, but you can, in your sleep then, uh, if you cultivate, you can call up uh, mantras and uh, images that can counteract those spirits and that disturb you, if that makes sense. So actually while you're sleeping, you can call forth one of these um, invocations, and it can clear the slate, so to speak. It's really quite interesting how it works. So there's lots of things going on here. Uh, I think we're only sort of scratching the surface of understanding the profundity and the depth, and maybe the, the range of psychological, neuropsychological states associated with mind-body in, in meditation. Uh, more and more is coming out as people do this, but there's a whole tradition with a lot of writing about this. It goes back a couple thousand years on these that would be very interesting. And I'm sure actually did um, his master's thesis on dreams in Buddhism. So when he comes back, you can ask him, or you can dream of him and ask him in your dream. <laughs> okay, any other questions? So what I was saying, if you're falling asleep while you're sitting, uh, it means you're not sitting straight. Uh, we went through the physical part of that. Uh, your breathing's probably not correct uh, through the go. So check your physical posture, check your breathing. And then most importantly, the mind is just drifting and wandering, if indeed it's not just from fatigue. In that case, you need to come back to your meditation topic, your pointedness, uh, your breathing, con whatever you're using to hold the mind. Um, and you will notice as soon as the mind waters, wanders, the body will collapse. So if you're sitting there like this, and all of a sudden your mind starts wandering, pretty soon this will happen. It's, it's almost a one-to-one -one total correlation. If you bring your mind back to concentration, don't let it drift and wander, you'll 
you'll maintain it. So those of you who are sleeping, does this make sense? Sleep deprived? Were you sleep deprived or just letting your mind wander? Because you raised your hand, I was just wondering. Yeah. Let your mind drift. Yeah. Said I saw your hand went up. Uh, what, sleep deprived. You're a graduate student. You're entitled to be sleep deprived. <laughs> Okay, okay. <laughs> All right. Um, if people start snoring, you can tap them. Um, I mean, gently tap them. Don't get into a big trip here. <laughs> um, usually in meditation retreats, there's this little board. I don't know if we have one here. It's hidden away. It's, it's a long board. It looks like, a, I think, a cricket board. I've never played cricket. How many people have played cricket? Yeah, wait, how, cricket board is sort of a flat, cricket bat. cricket bat, sorry, cricket bat, okay, it's a flat piece of, yeah, but you, wouldn't put one if it struck one. you wouldn't put it was struck one, so you take a light cricket bat, made of balsam wood or something, and then, we won't do that here, but somebody walks around, and then when you start falling asleep like that, they take that uh, meditation bat, and the, it's flat, and the, yeah, and they hit you on the shoulder with it, not on your bone, but on the fleshy part, which causes you to wake up. And then you're so delighted when they do that, you say, thank you. <laughs> you don't say, <laughs> uh, And usually if, that, if you get tapped three times, then you're asked to stand up for the rest of the sit and, and stay alert. And this helps keep a kind of decorum of meditation in the hall. Um, when Houston Smith went to Japan to get his Satori, um, he got whacked by the bat a number of times because uh, he got tired seeking it and then fell asleep. Uh, and then his teacher signed it for him and gave it to him as a memento. And uh, so he gave it to us as a memento, so we have it upstairs. So if you wanna, want to, we can bring down Houston's bat and <laughs> designate somebody to go around to tap those who fall asleep. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Were you going to ask a? You answered. I answered it. Okay. All right. So we're going to go back to Han Chan's text tonight, and he is talking about uh, meditation cultivation. Um, so next, don't vainly. Is that where we are? Mm, that's a previous passage. Let's go back one more. Oh, there we go. So uh, let's let's we'll go back over this again. I'm going to um, uh, cross through vainly there, and I will come back and retranslate that because we had a good discussion last week about. Um, you could just say, "Don't uh, yearn for enlightenment." Okay, just change it. Don't yearn for enlightenment. Uh, the true mind, our true mind, is wondrous and perfect. There is nothing whatsoever to long for. Um, so he's not saying don't long or yearn for enlightenment um, because it'll stir up desires or passions or frustrations. Um, but really he's saying theoretically there's no reason to yearn for everything because that state is inherent and whole and complete. And so the actual yearning for it is not only unnecessary but distracts you from attending to that here and now. Um, as the thoughts harden and congeal, meaning these thoughts of seeking and wanting, um, our state of mind then becomes a struggle between the sense organs and the sense objects. Uh, and so at this, this state of what he's talking about is if you have yearnings, if you have these kinds of uh, false aspirations or false hankerings, um, then these start to become rigidly fixed. It's, it's almost like jello starting to congeal. And our mind then becomes locked as if frozen. And then we have this struggle going on between the sense organs and the sense objects. Now, this can manifest as uh, almost the inability to c 
control the eyes and what they look at to, to get the ears away from grasping attention, going after sounds. Same with the nose, uh, flavors, uh, physical sensations all over the map. And then, of course, just wild imaginings and fantasies and thoughts and flights of fancy and so forth. These are the what are called the sex organs, so the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and also the uh, sort of the conscious or discriminatory intellect. And then the sense objects are obviously sight, sounds, uh, what we smell, what we taste, uh, what we're kinesthetically aware of. So it would be, um, sometimes it's called uh, physical sensibilities, or what's a better word for that? Um, tactile, that's a good one, tactile. Uh, so it involves the, the, the skin um, and the, the nerves related to that uh, can get involved in this. And then the, the actual sixth one is what, what are called objects of mind, which is small d dharmas. And this has to do with the whole phenomenology of what the conscious mind does. So he says, once that, there's a struggle going on there. The eyes you know, can't control themselves, they're constantly going on. So when this happens, uh, when you're sitting in meditation, what it means is um, suddenly you'll find yourself unable to control your eyes. Somebody comes in the hall, you're watching them. Someone leaves the hall, you're watching them. Um, you're constantly looking around. As soon as you stop the meditation, your mind, your eyes are just like glomming on to anything, just grabbing on to sights and sound, and your ears are doing the same thing. And so it's like a heightened awareness, but it's also a little bit frenetic. It can't be calmed. Um, and you want and you want to attach and want to grab to these. So from after you have a certain amount of stillness, uh, there's an impatience that arises. And the impatience that arising is the resistance that habit energy has to being calm and gaining insight. So it's a really, there's a really internal struggle going on here. You resolve to meditate, you really want to do it. But in, in another way, the mind that is habitually unsubdued, that is pretty wild uh, and just given to impulses, starts to complain. It's almost like a little kid, and sometimes it's compared to this. And so it starts to want uh, to divert from single-mindedness. Um, in, fr in French, uh, entertainment is divertissement. It's very interesting. So it wants entertainment. It, it wants not to be single-minded because single-minded is putting you on that spiritual hot seat uh, to reunite with your fundamental nature. So that's what happens when he's talking about there's a struggle going on between the sense organs and the sense objects. And if you don't understand that this is arising from the mind itself being confused and wanting something, then you start to fight with the sense objects. So you say, oh, it's, well, it's, uh, it's beautiful clothes. I'll get rid of all my beautiful clothes. Or it's, uh, it's music, and so I'll stop all music. Um, or it's uh, fragrances, so I'll, I'll get rid of all fragrances. And you become, you get on a kind of repressive thing where you're blaming the sense objects for your diversion. <laughs> and this doesn't just apply to meditators. This applies across the board. Uh, you can see this uh, in, in places, for example, uh, where, uh, how shall I put it, mm. where women are projected as temptresses and seducers, and therefore the solution is to cover them over with cloths or hide them away. Well, the problem is the mind that wants and desires. It's not but then you repress the object of your desire, thinking that you're doing some kind of liberating technique here, and it's just really foolish. And in fact, we know that that just enhances it. So, <laughs> so it's not only foolish, but it's counterproductive. And it's also denial, because the problem is not outside. The problem is with one's own mind. So the same thing is if you start uh, smashing icons and become a iconoclast of sights and sounds and smells, um, even to the point you'll say, we, we won't look at it, images or pictures, we'll take all images and pictures away because they seduce the mind into this. And so the struggle is a false struggle. And by you think, finally, when I repress everything, when I crush everything down, it'll be pure. This is one of the language phrases that's used. It'll be pure, and I will be pure. And then that purity, then I will have liberation and awakening. Um, 
but he's saying here it's a, it's a futile struggle and it leads to confusion and this confusion then leads to karma. Now he's using karma here as um, intentional action and he's also using it here in a kind of negative sense because karma is not necessarily what we think is like karma is bad and evil, right? I mean, that's how you usually hear it, right? Something happens. Um, sometimes they say bad karma when they're being, yeah, when they're being more specific, but often they'll just say karma in a kind of like, uh, you lost your job, that's your karma. Um, uh, how else does it work? You lost your fortune, that's your karma. Uh, usually they use it in a kind of punitive way in the sense that uh, you got busted for stealing from the company. That's your karma, meaning you got what you deserved. So it's your just rewards. It's used in that sense. But here karma just means, from the Buddhist point of view, intentional action of body, of speech, and of thought. So even though you don't do anything, and even though you don't say anything, you can still generate karma through the third one, which is your mind and your thought and in some ways this is the most significant because it's at the real root of words and actions so um, you can't feel as if oh I'm pure in my karma because I didn't do anything violating the precepts and I didn't insult or say anything bad to anyone because um, I bit my tongue you know <laughs> but biting, biting the tongue means the mind has gone into that zone and that generates karma, sure as it generates changes in your physiology, you know. So these three karmas, it's called the three karmas of body, mouth, and mind, are where it's generated and it's intentional action. It's not un, uh, unintentional action. So here he's talking about intentional unwholesome karma, karma that leads to then mistakes, that lead to uh, returns or causes leading to effects that come back to obstruct, to harm oneself, to harm others, to create a kind of legacy or a, a, a habitual pattern of, of frustration and um, uh, disappointment, um, confusion, lack of satisfaction in one's life. All of this is a result of this intentional actions that then bring this return. Yeah. So uh, I, I see that there must be a balance here between these things. I hear you, what I hear you talking about is uh, sort of over, going, stepping over the bounds of control, trying to control your environment when you're trying to vainly hope for enlightenment or achieve enlightenment, right? Uh, and it's, so part of it is the motivation that you because we're, we're exerting control over our environment here when we're meditating, right? We're, we're all sitting in rows, we're, we have men and women separated, we're exerting some control over the environment, we're trying to keep it quiet. At what point does that become overly onerous and we're harming ourselves and our ability to uh, you know, get in touch with our true nature or whatever you might call it. Right. Good question. Everybody understand the question? Do I have to repeat the question? Yeah, they're saying yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. So the question is, uh, when does uh, control of one's environment conducive to meditation and practice, uh, such as a quiet room, uh, this monastic setting, having men and women on one side the other, and even sort of maybe... Um, uh, reducing sound intrusions yeah. and so forth, which is hard to do in Berkeley and, and all of that. When does that become an obstacle as opposed to an enhancement? And there's no fixed answer to this. Um, one person's heaven is another's hell. Uh, I, I keep going back to um, Milton, who said, the mind is its own place and in itself can make a hell of heaven and a heaven of hell. And what it means is, if you have the right state of mind, a minimal amount of this is just enough and you're fine. Uh, if a car goes by, you know, you just 
let it go uh, whatnot. Somebody's got a sniffle or a sneeze. You don't get obsessive over it. But one way to judge it is if you're getting afflicted. If you're getting afflicted, either um, negatively bothered, upset, or afflicted in the sense of imperious and domineering and kind of judgmental, you know you've lost the balance. So the Buddha is always talking about a middle way between extremes. And middle way means lots of things, of course. It means between eternalism and nihilism, between hedonism and self-repression. But it also means, you know, a kind of equanimity and balance so that um, you do not allow yourself to lose the composure and equanimity which these things should provide. So my teacher used to say, too much is the same as too little, and too little is the same as too much. And so regarding food and clothes and sleep and relationships, you strive to have a balance where it's not too much and it's not too little. I mean, this sounds kind of trite, but only you can be the judge of what that is. You know what I'm saying? It's like the middle way is not some absolute middle way with all these rules that you follow, but it's a question of uh, balance that you start to feel. And your middle way will change over your lifetime and over your practice. So what, what, at, what at one point uh, would have been um, like a no-brainer for you to go out and get stoned and drunk and blah, 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 now becomes like crazy. You wouldn't even think of doing that. Uh, so it was once before uh, a normal activity now becomes not so tolerable, not so allowable. And, you know, the idea of sitting for two hours on moving with your legs crossed, which might have seemed at one point like, wow, what a waste of time, now becomes uh, actually, yeah, kind of cool and keeps you in a balance. So the trick with this is, is to be nimble and responsive with these conditions, with the external sights and sounds, and you adjust them, always realizing that 90% to 100%, I would say, almost it's always how you are perceiving them rather than them in themselves. Right. So I guess the quickest way to give the answer to that is you have to be attuned to how it feels. How it feels. And I don't mean how it feels in a very kind of superficial hedonistic sense but in, in the deep sense by which we judge, is this a good relationship or not? Is this a good career or not? Is, is this a good way to talk to people or not? Is, are these good friends or not? That level, what you know that, is the level, the sensibility you want to activate and, and then be judging, am I too much or too little here? feel good about, right? Uh, telling the kids to shut up would be an extreme example, or, you know, uh, or sort of... I just use duct tape, and then the kids... You know, <laughs> <no>. <laughs> They're really quiet. Very, <laughs> very fun, very expedient. Uh, the but, thing... The thing it, it also, it seems to me, it's, it's what is it leading, what is that desire for control leading you to do? Is well... That, this, this, this desire for control is actually what he would be describing as misplaced. Because what you're trying to control and regulate is your own mind right. yeah. and your own reactions to things. Not So the misplaced control is but placing it out and controlling the, the environment, yes. which will never succeed. Right. <laughs> the delusion of dictators. You will never control and master the external environment, the delusion of parents. <laughs> you know, it's just like, I am in charge, and I'm going to make this thing. No, it just doesn't work. We're not in charge. So what he's saying is misplaced here, is saying, I don't have awakening. I don't have the wherewithal. It comes from outside. It's going to come from some divine light shooting through the window into my ears or my eyes. Therefore, her sniveling and sneezing is interrupting the reception. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> That, that's what leads to sort of, um, how shall I say it, almost obsessive control of externals. 
And what he's saying, when you get into that, it's indicative that you have now lost the ground, which is your own mind, and you're completely now in externals, thinking I gain it or I lose it by external conditions. When in fact, that's not at all what's going on. So what he's saying is, yes, you do a minimal amount to whatever you need. Um, you know, I'd be with my teacher, and he could be sitting in meditation, unmoving, uh, in a car with even the radio on. And I would be constantly distracted. We're on an airplane. I remember traveling on an airplane. He just sat there, a slight smile on his face for the whole flight, and I was like watching the movie, what the food was coming, you know, what the guy next to me was reading. And, it, and it's sort of like, and I was thinking, we should have a samadhi plane. <laughs> well, you know, what, be the only one on the flight, right? And then probably the hum of the engines would drive me nuts. You know, why can't they shut the engines down? So I put the noise-canceling stuff on, you know. At some point, when you're externally driven, it becomes absurd what you do. And you start to realize, wait a minute, what's the problem here? Is it me or is it this? So as you get better at this balancing, less and less things outside bother you. Yeah. It's just that's how things are, and it's not like... But if you go out to them, either seeking to get them or to push them away. That's the struggle he's talking about. That is the nature, very nature in, in Sanskrit of grasping. Grasping doesn't mean you just grab onto what you want. It also means you push away what you don't want. Yeah. Both are forms of grasping. And both, in this sense, have to do with if you externalize it, you'll never, ever, I mean, even rationally speaking, you'll never control that environment. But even more important, from this point of view, you're, you're moving off the mind ground into the externals and it will just further, further collapse. Um, I don't know how else to say this, except, you know, I'd like to give, if I gave a black and white answer, it wouldn't be true, but you all need to feel what that is for you. How much meditation is enough? How much is too much? How much is too little? How much food? I mean, let's get down the base. How much food is enough or too little? Because <laughs> I remember once asked my teacher, What's the middle way? Like it was some metaphysical thing. He said, just knowing how much to eat, what clothes to wear, how much enough sleep. Start with that. Huh? Well, that's too simple. He said, well, then how come some days you don't eat enough and some days you overeat? You never seem to know when to stop. Oh. And you have enough clothes, but you go out and buy more. And then you give them away, and then you feel you don't have enough, and so on and so forth. Uh oh. And you, you worry so you can't sleep, and then you sleep because you're worried, and you know, blah, 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 blah. And he says, just figuring that out would be a good start. I was like, oh. <laughs> you know, sounds kind of silly, but if you think about it, that's the beginning of the middle way, is balancing these ordinary things. Um, and it's not, just another example, when Hung Shur and I were cultivating pretty intensely, we were really watching our food because you start to notice how food has a profound effect on your emotions and your mindfulness and your state of well-being and whatnot. And I was like, wow, that's pretty interesting. And so if we ate too much, when we went to bow, we would just bow. <laughs> I mean, that happened. It's like I was behind him, sure, and he was bowing. I thought, whoa, he's entered the bowing samadhi. Well, he fell asleep because we had this really super rich lunch. And then when he came up from his bow, there was his third eye, which was a actual <laughs> eucalyptus berry that had stuck into his forehead that he had pressed his forehead into. <laughs> uh, and so, but if we didn't have enough, then we'd get heady and dizzy, and we wouldn't be able to make through the day. So we had to actually sort of think, well, what's just right? And, you know, my teacher come out and say, well, eat till you're about 80, 85 percent full. Don't eat, you know, sort of give advice like this. Um, so we're, we're taking notes on this, and then I remember one time the, the teacher came out, and Hung Shai were just shoving down these carrots. Somebody brought carrots out, and he's looking at us, and he said, what are you guys doing while we're eating these carrots? He said, well, there's all this other stuff. Why are you eating so many carrots? These carrots aren't good for you. Huh? He says, that's what they feed the war horses in China. You know, they give the war horses in China carrots and they can go for miles and days because they have all this young energy. You guys are 20 some, 30 years old. You don't need all these carrots. You know, don't eat so many carrots. It's just like, and it was like 
springtime going into summer, he said, you know, natural energy is just full. Reduce your carrots and eat a little more of this and that. And so, so I made this vow, okay, no more carrots. <laughs> and so um, next time the master came out, it was in the winter, and uh, there was this big dish of you know, steamed carrots, and I was like, no, no <laughs> carrots. And I noticed the teacher was eating the carrots. And I'm going, what is this? For, you know, now he tells, now he's eating the carrots. So I said, master, you said, he said, what did I say? He said, not to eat the carrots. And he goes, you guys are so slow. <laughs> and he, he said, when did I tell you that? Well, you told us, what time of the year was that? Well, it was spring going into summer. He said, spring and summer, your natural energy is full, so you reduce carrots. Winter, your energy is low, you need to bolster yourself. So if it's too much, at, he said, you don't get this yet? <laughs> See, and we were originally trying to make these into rules. Well, this is the right way to do it. And, you know, and the same thing would happen with uh, laughter. Somebody might come and have something happen, and the master would tell a joke and laugh. Everything, you know, laughter. I'm not going to laugh, you know, because that's an outflow, blah, blah, blah. And he'd say, what are, what are you guys? And he, he, he'd take, he go, you're like wood. You're just moved. It's like a piece of wood. You, you don't know when it's time to laugh, you don't laugh. And when it's time not to laugh, you laugh. Can't you get these things right? And it was like, it's because we were in a struggle between the sense organs and the sense objects and trying to rigidly narrow it down to, was this rule or that rule? And as by doing that, we were losing the feeling, the sensibility that would tell us naturally what to do. And so this naturalness, which is a cultivated naturalness that comes from attuning to your middle way, means you act appropriately in every situation. You don't go to excess, you're not deficient. It's like, and this starts to come as you attune to listening to yourself and not simply externalizing everything. There's a wonderful uh, sutta that maybe we'll do here on a Friday night. We're using it in one of our classes. It comes from a Pali text. Um, it's called the Mango Sutta. But in that, there's a metaphor of where the Buddha's uh, son, Rahula, has become a monk. And he asked his father, teacher now, um, how is it that we know what to do? what's right or wrong? How is it that we, when we're about to do intentional karma, we should either do it or not do it? How do we decide that? And the Buddha then gives this wonderful analogy called the mirror analogy where he explains to Rahula how to use your own sensibilities, your own reflective apparatus, body, mind, emotions, thoughts, to actually evaluate in any situation whether you should do this or not do that. And it's not just a should because it's the rules, but it's a, it's a dynamic living sensibility that we have. And if cultivation is anything, it's, it's opening up our natural attunement and sensibilities to fully function. Our eyes to fully function, our ears to fully function, our human sensibilities to fully function. And when they're functioning and really sensitive and attuned, it's really easy because it's so obvious. It's in struggling and overthinking that we shut those down and then end up making mistakes. And that's what he's talking about here. He's saying, now you think you don't have it. You're not paying attention to your own sensibilities. You're looking outside. And the more you look, the more confusion you're going to do and the more mistakes you're going to make, which is what he means by karma here. Is this... Oh, good questions. Okay. So the key to this is actually developing and perfecting all the human capacity we have to know, to feel, to sense, to be aware of, not in an indulgent way, nor to repress it, but to attune it so it's really picking on on what's going on. We're really aware of what's going on around us. And then we naturally stay in the middle way. We naturally do what's right because it's, it's the best. It's the optimal. Yeah, this is really good. Uh, one of the views in here I was... Um, we won't have time to go into all this tonight, so I'm gonna, I'll just ramble on here. Um, one of the views he's talking about, there's different kinds of views that are... To go back, this cultivation is developing insight or wisdom, sometimes just called vidya, as opposed to avidya, meaning ignorance. Vidya is to know, to see clearly. 
or prajna or pana, whatever you want to say. It's our natural ability to have this full capacity available to us to see and know. This consists of investigating, looking into things, observation, profound observation, not just quick observation, but really observing, watching. Um, sometimes if you close your eyes in a conversation, your ears will observe in ways you don't normally let them observe. They will hear nuance that wasn't, that's always there, but we just don't because we're distracted. So you learn to observe, to investigate, but you also have to have correct theory. You have to realize, well, you're cultivating within, you're cultivating your mind ground and not, so if you start to look outside, then you know correct theory and go wrong. But it also means you go through this process, investigating, observing, untangling the mind, cleansing it, purifying, as you, and you start to see uh, more and more like this. What Han Chan is talking about here, he's saying there's some wrong theories that will mess you up. So it doesn't just mean, oh, you just cultivate it, you sit in meditation for five hours. You know, that's what some of the mistakes I was telling some of the early disciples thought when they came to my teacher. I'm just going to cross my legs and sit in meditation, unmoving for five hours, five days, five weeks, and I won't eat or sleep until I get awakened. And my teacher goes, mm, God, don't, don't do that. But I want to. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and invariably, they just went off, you know, wacko. Um, and then he would bring them back and say, okay, now read this text. This is the Sharangama Sutra. You should read this. It tells you how to do this in a correct way. Well, I don't need no text. I'm just going to, you might, okay, okay, okay. So even then, sometimes people wouldn't listen. But he would say, you know, if you practice without the correct theory, it's blind. You're like a blind person. You can't get out because you can't see any exit entrance. You're just bouncing off the walls. But if you just have the theory and the, and it's correct, but you don't practice, then it's sterile. It doesn't produce any results. So you have to bring, bring the two together. Um, so one of the wrong views that Han Chan is talking about here is seeking, yearning for awakening. This is one of the fundamental wrong views, because by doing that, you see, it leads you away from all these things we've just been talking about. But there's another uh, one that's interesting. Um, this one is called sometimes restrictive morality. It's one of the five dirty or wrong views. And um, I never quite understood that. Like one wrong view is to deny causation. You know, just causation doesn't apply. Well, that sort of stops you in your tracks from cultivating. Um, another uh, wrong view is holding to your opinions so strongly that even in the face of contrary evidence, you don't change your mind. Now, fortunately, this only exists in India 2,000 years ago. This is not a common thing <laughs> that you would run into today. But one of the wrong views is this restrictive morality, and what it means is you hold to moral precepts and to rituals and devotions and rites as the, the, the sufficient way to get Bodhi and Nirvana. In other words, you feel if I hold these strictly to the letter and if I do these rituals and ceremonies just totally correct, I will be rewarded with awakening and liberation. And this is actually called a wrong view. It's actually listed as a wrong view. Now that doesn't mean that holding precepts and the rites and rituals and devotions are wrong. They can be a very good device for beginning to establish mindfulness and so forth. So they're kind of necessary in some ways. But the wrong view is thinking that that alone will get you there. So if I do this particular worship, whatever it is, and I do it religiously every day, I put out the flowers and the, you know, I do this whole thing and I make sure it's an almost anally retentive doing this. Obsessive compulsive ritual. And you, but it's still... See, it's like, it's out there. It's thinking, I'll be rewarded for this, you know, or something magic's going to happen here. Whereas it, the reason it's a wrong view is that the only way to get awakened and to be liberated is to get rid of klesha, to get rid of the afflictions of, my, of mind and habit, to actually straighten out the mind and the heart. 
That's the only way. So while these devotions and rituals can help bring about a certain mindfulness, you know, you say, well, we come in here, we have this environment. We do. That is conducive to mindfulness, but it is not sufficient to mindfulness. Because while you're doing that, and there's a great story um, about this, because I, I saw it firsthand. It was like, so you go to the temple and you offer things to the Bodhis, Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, right? You all do this? Know about this? You've seen people do this, bringing fruit and flowers and incense. So when we were in Asia, we went to this place, and I was just going to go down and do my simple little exercise. We had arrived, and I was going to go down to the Buddha hall and, you know, offer a stick of incense. And I couldn't get in. I mean, the crowds were just elbowing and jostling each other. And um, one, one of the, sometimes you have a little bowl of oil with a flame burning. And then when the oil gets down, you can offer oil. And it's kind of symbolic of increasing the light and so on and so forth. Well, they had, you know, <laughs> bowls of oil, you know. And people were pouring the oil in and it was dripping all over the sides, all over the altar, and they're trying to scoop it out, and they couldn't scoop it out fast enough. People would come with these, you know, jugs of oil. <laughs> well, and you're thinking, you know, she gave a quart. I'm going to give a gallon. <laughs> and I got more merit and virtue than her. And so that was happening. And I was like, I was slipping on the oil. And I was going, whoa. And then I noticed all these beautiful Buddha images were ochre colored, almost black. And I couldn't figure out why, but my eyes were watering. And I realized it was the incense smoke. And the incense smoke, they didn't just have like we had. I, I lit a little stick tonight, symbolic of purifying the air. Now, if all you saw me do that and said, whoa, he's lighting incense. He must get merit and virtue. So let's all of us go up and light a stick. Well, that would be 40 sticks of incense. So we'd still be gagging and choking here. Moreover, some people would say, well, he did one. I'm doing two. Then I get more. So by the time I got there, there were people coming in. They were outside selling the incense stick. They were buying wads of incense sticks, 50 to 100. They were lighting the whole thing and going like this, trying to shake it out because you're not supposed to blow on it. That's superstitious, right? You don't blow out incense because you're putting your bad breath on it and the gods don't want it. I mean, even if you gargle, they don't want it. So you got to shake it out. you got to do this. Well, if you got 100, 150 sticks, that's pretty hard to do. <laughs> and then they just drop these in. And then the next person comes. And then somebody comes with a baseball bat stick of incense. I mean, these are the big ones they sell outside. They're that thick. They're that tall. I mean, these, these are the mother of all incense sticks. And so you don't even bother with a 50 or 100. You take one of these big things, you know, and bring it, boom, boom, and you set it down. Well, pretty soon, all the incense sticks were catching on fire. And so the monks were frantically walking around trying to keep the temple from burning down because the incense, not only would it get, catch on fire there, look at, you know, you got 650 sticks of incense on the thing. They're all next to each other. And then some of them are falling out and over. So the altar cloth has all these black burn marks all over it. And going, wow, what's going on here? That's the view of restrictive morality. And my, my teacher said, he said, you guys really don't get it. You, you're thinking the Buddha is actually like a politician. <laughs> huh? That's actually slandering the Buddha. No, no. We, he says, well, you people, you get one thing that's good, you think if it's once good, ten's better. That's, he says, that's the mind of greed. So you think the Buddha is the same way. He's like, one stick, that's not, a, ooh, no, I got a hundred. You got my attention. You know, like a bribe to a politician. <laughs> How big is the envelope before I act for you? This kind of, he says, this is really stick. He says, it's symbolic. One stick purifies the Dharma realm. That's all you need. He says, by the way, if you put a hundred sticks and you don't purify your mind, you haven't even purified your own little realm, much less the Dharma realm. And people got really upset. Well, this is the way we've always been doing it. This is what our teachers told us was the proper Dharma. So the story I was going to tell you, it's a really wonderful story of there was this nun who had her Buddha image her little Buddha image, and it was really a cute Buddha image, and a uh, nice white, um, that would be like white jade, and she, wherever she went, she would put that in her room, 
And then she would just not bow to the images down here because it wasn't hers. Hers was special. And she never let anybody else bow to her image. She was cultivating this special relationship with her image. Well, she finally went to this one temple, and they said, I'm sorry, but you can't do that in your rooms. This is a community, and we don't want people just to worship in the rooms. You, you need to, well, what am I supposed to do? She said, well, just put it on the altar with all the other images there, and everybody can bow to them. And so she thought, well, I don't want them bowing to my image. I only want to bow to my image because mine's special. So what she devised was a little incense thing on the bottom and then a funnel so that when she lit incense, instead of the incense smoke going to radiate the other images, which she felt would take away from her merit and virtue, the funnel kept the smoke going only up to her image. So she designed this funnel just right so when she lit her little incense you know, thing on the bottom, the smoke would funnel up and only go to her image. <laughs> and so it went, and the teacher said nothing. And then uh, over time, finally, she finally came in in tears and realized what she had done is turned her image black. So by only funneling the smoke to her image, this beautiful white image turned into something black. And the teacher said, everything's made from mind alone, do you understand? A small mind turns the Buddha into something dark and black. A big mind, you know, liberates and so on and so forth. So this was a uh, a sort of teaching along those lines. It's actually based on a, on a true story. Uh, so again, what Han Chan's doing here, and we'll come back to this again next week, is the importance of staying on the mind ground, paying attention to what is in that space, and not getting seeking outside uh, either for this liberation or with the idea that if you push away the right things, it'll happen to you. Um, but and we ran out of time tonight, so that is a lot more. Well, uh, we'll get back to it, and I'll maybe tell you some own, some stories of my own uh, on on this. Okay, and we didn't get to our Confucian text tonight, so that's coming next week as well. But um, good questions, and I'd rather keep it lively with good questions than just pumping through this material, although. Some of my students are going to say, you are so slow, we're never going to finish. <laughs> I don't know who would say that, but there are some who would say that. Okay, any announcements? Nothing to announce? Okay, if you have questions, they come up, uh, bring them back next week, and we'll try our best to look into them. We're going to do the transfer.